Okay, well, hello. Uh, my name is David Sloan Wilson, and this webinar is part of a book project called uh, Evolution and Contextual Behavioral Science, a Reunification. And um, this is a project with uh, Steve Hayes, who is also with us uh, today. And uh, what the book does is pair for a number of major topics, uh, has a chapter, two chapters, one from evolutionists uh, and others from contextual behavioral scientists. And then uh, the webinar has these authors who have read each other's chapters and are now going to have a discussion, uh, which will be transcribed and will appear in the book. But of course, the webinar also stands on its own. And our topic for today is uh, psychopathology and behavior change. And our evolutionist is uh, Renee Duckworth from the University of Arizona. Uh, Renee, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, so I'm uh, an associate professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the uh, University of Arizona. And my research interests are broadly um, focused on the evolution of behavior. And so I've been very interested in um, understanding the evolution of behavior at, at all different scales from the species to population level, as well as the more proximate um, mechanistic uh, origins of behavioral variation. And so that's led me to, um, to do various research topics on uh, from personality variation to understanding how behavior plays a role in ecological feedbacks and, and evolution of species. And that's mostly for non-human species? Do you include humans per se? Yeah, I've, um, I think this project is actually leading me into that realm of interest. So I, I've always been interested in it, but definitely my research has stayed focused on um, animals and, and primarily I'm an ornithologist, so I study birds. That's my main study system. Yeah, yeah. Well, part of the reunification, of course, is to include cross-species comparisons uh, as a very important part of this. And on the um, uh, CBS side, we have Steve and uh, Jean-Louis uh, Monestes. Uh, could, gentlemen, could you please uh, introduce yourselves and say just a little bit about your background? Go ahead, Jean-Louis. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm Jean-Louis Monestes. I'm a professor in clinical psychology in France, uh, Grenoble Alps University. And I uh, graduated about <clears throat> 20 years ago now in behavior analysis. And at the same time, I was, um, I was working as a clinical psychologist. So I was very interested at first um, in the way behavior can spread among groups. At first, among groups of uh, animals, actually. I was working in uh, behavioral ecology on a model that was called, that was called uh, ideal free distribution. And then um, I worked uh, on uh, taboos, actually. I was uh, grounded on the work of Marvin Harris, which is, uh, who is uh, an anthropologist. So that story about uh, the way beha behaviors can spread among people was really um, important for me. And then I, I kind of uh, fall of you on your work, uh, Steve, about uh, verbal behavior and rule governed behavior and the way that uh, those kind of behaviors can, um, in a way, block us from the contact we have with the, let's say, concrete tendencies. And all that story uh, was resonating with what I could observe with my clients, uh, mostly uh, suffering from or presenting uh, delusions. But at the, at the same time, I was interested by, let's say, learning processes, the way we can change, but how we were uh, locked in kind of, uh, of behaviors, uh, either individually or in groups. So, all this took place, and uh, let's say that um, the whole story was, uh, was uh, how can I say that? Um, I had, as a, as a friend, I would say the story about selection and uh, Darwinism and all that stuff that are not very common in psychology, but I was very interested in all that. I kind of uh, uh, missed one of my um, uh, terms because I was reading everything on uh, monkeys and things like that that wasn't in the program at all. It was really uh, interested for me. Awesome. Steve. I'm Steve Hayes, and I'm a professor uh, of psychology at the University of Nevada in Reno. Um, and uh, contextual behavioral science has been the central focus uh, of my work over uh, many years. It, it, it's essentially a, a slightly different face of behavior analysis. I was trained as a behavior analyst 
um, got my degree in clinical psychology, but took my minor in experimental psychology, primarily working with animal models. So a lot of my early studies were with rats and pigeons and so forth, trying to understand basic uh, behavioral processes and became uh, frustrated in the clinical side uh, with the degree to which those uh, principles would explain the kinds of things I saw with my clients and with myself. Uh, I usually tell the story that the, the really turning point to, was around the development of uh, panic disorder and, and trying to find my way out of that and became fascinated by the, the impact of verbal rules on behavioral rigidity. So we did a whole series of studies on rule-governed behavior showing that verbal rules in humans can produce a spe spectacular amount of insensitivity to direct experience. And um, that seemed to comport with my own experience and with that of my clients. And so that set me on a, about a 30, 35 year uh, journey trying to understand how to alter those processes and then bring them into the clinic, developing a basic account of language and cognition called relational frame theory and a, an approach to clinical uh, work in the called acceptance and commitment therapy. So uh, I'm here as a person interested in uh, behavioral variation and its uh, toxic effects uh, when uh, you get into certain corners of human experience where uh, the logical, reasonable, sensible thing to do turns out to be pathological. Right, awesome. Okay, well, so uh, in the next stage of our conversation, uh, we need to have brief summaries of our chapters. So uh, Renee, let me uh, begin once again with you. Could you just summarize in a few minutes uh, uh, basically uh, what you tried to convey in your uh, very excellent chapter? Yeah, so um, I think one of the main themes of my paper is that inflexibility of behavior is inevitable. And this is because it's underlain by the neuroendocrine system. And so any changes in behavior can only occur essentially as fast as various changes can occur in underlying neuroendocrine components. And so this could be lightning quick, you know, it was something such as neural firing, which we see in the fact that organisms can respond and react very quickly to stimuli in their environment. But <clears throat> this type of reactivity is um, I would argue very distinct from a person's sort of entrenched behavior patterns, like the level or the, the, the predictable patterns that, that organisms show on a daily basis. And so, um, and, and this is, these patterns in, in turn are, are strongly influenced by an individual's personality or temperament. And so in turn, I would argue that personality essentially exists because it is underlain by brain structure. Um, overall gross structural variation of the brain, you know, such as the you know, relative um, variation in the size of distinct brain components is the most difficult aspect of the neuroendocrine system to change rapidly post-development. And so this um, maps very nicely, um, at least in, the in terms of how quickly they change, um, onto personality variation that we see. However, all that said, the brain is an organism or is an organ that whose job is to integrate information um, from the environment with past information um, that, the, that the organism has learned to enable it to learn and respond to the environment flexibly. And so the observation of personality variation in, in its sort of structural basis in no way, I think, undermines behavioral flexibility. And I would argue that it actually, to some extent, enables behavioral flexibility by provi providing this sort of strong scaffold on which um, more flexible components of behavior can function. And so the important um, uh, point from my perspective, and that's relevant, I think, to this discussion and, and the topic of psychopathology, is that if we have an understanding of what components of behavior are meant to be flexible versus inflexible, it can clarify what aspects of behavior cannot easily be changed post-development. And so that implies that there also might be substantial differences among individuals in how behavioral change occurs. And if, if you can sort of incorporate that into your understanding um, of, of psychotherapy, that might be really powerful approach to um, helping uh, uh, specific um, problems of behavioral inflexibility. And another important point um, that I make in the paper is that 
the different axes of personality variation, you know, for example, things like introversion versus extroversion, sociability, et cetera, um, they may reflect trade-offs in neural processes. And an example, just as an example in the paper, I give the trade-off of the speed accuracy trade-off. And, and I um, spend some time on this one because it's one of the few that's been really well worked out on a neural, neurological basis. Um, but basically the speed ac accuracy trade-off occurs because um, you can either make decisions slowly with a high accuracy or fast with a high error rate. And we know the neural um, basis of that. And the interesting thing is that this trade-off correlates with various aspects of personality variation. And there are a number of other trade-offs that um, I also outline in the paper. But the main point is that um, <clears throat> I think it's possible that another way besides just behavioral inflexibility per se, but another way that um, psychopathologies can manifest is when people are at the extremes of these neural trade-offs. And so it, while it might not be possible to make people more flexible necessarily in certain components of the personality, it may be possible to moderate the trade-offs um, to help people essentially become more centered. And, and I think there are a number of studies that suggest that, that some of the therapeutic techniques work by essentially modulating these trade-offs to some extent by engaging multiple brain systems in, in integrate, <clears throat> excuse me, integrating their functions. Um, and then just the last uh, point I guess I'll make is, um, I think this topic raises some very interesting questions for me from an evolutionary perspective, because there seems to be this general assumption, um, not just in psychology, but also in evolutionary biology, that higher flexibility of behavior is universally good. But from my perspective, you can't have flexibility without inflexibility. They sort of go hand in hand. They're, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. Um, for example, you know, the ultimate manifestation of behavioral flexibility is learning. But learning by its very nature leads to the entrenchment of some behaviors as an organism figures out what works and what doesn't and basically sticks with the um, behaviors that work. And so I think an important larger question um, that this whole um, discussion and, and this whole project has, has raised for me is it brings up the question of when behavioral, uh, behavioral inflexibility is a good or a bad thing, when is it functional or not functional? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's great. And uh, I have to repeat one part of your paper, which I just love so much, uh, the analogy of a skeleton as something which is by definition inflexible. Our bones are rigid. And yet... Uh, our skeleton is designed to move. So uh, that that's a, to me is a wonderful um, illustration of the concept of how uh, a flex, a flexibility requires inflexibility. So uh, to think of, of uh, personality as like that or whatever underlies our behaviors as like that is really a, a powerful metaphor. Okay, well, uh, uh, Steve and Jean-Louis, uh, uh, please take your turn summarizing your paper, your chapter. Well, let me go ahead and uh, start. Um, what we uh, sought to do in this paper is to, in particular, look at variation selection, uh, uh, you know, issues of um, retention and context and level and uh, dimension, which are also important. Uh, we didn't dive into as much, but we, in order to sort of constrain it, we looked at the relationship of variation and uh, selection to both psychopathology and to psychotherapy. We're both clinical psychologists and we're especially focused on what are the kinds of problems that uh, get people into situations uh, where they need to seek uh, help and behavior change and, and how, do, how do we accomplish that. We started out, this, the strategy was to take uh, a psychological process that is transdiagnostic and that predicts poor outcomes just in natural kind of uh, longitudinal models, but also can be targeted and changed in psychotherapy and can mediate, be shown to be functionally important as a pathway to change in uh, producing uh, reductions in problems and increase in uh, behavioral uh, prosperity. And the one we picked was psychological inflexibility because it's arguably the, the single best collection of processes to, to do both those things. Despite the word inflexibility, it doesn't, you can't translate it immediately to behavioral flexibility. Part of the paper was to try to pull apart 
the, uh, the aspects of it and the different ways that we can think of flexibility and inflexibility to sort of uh, make, uh, make sense of, uh, of that. And so we, we distinguish between functional and formal uh, variation as, as a, a bit of a scaffolding to explore that uh, dialectic of um, both structure and change. And Jean-Louis, you want to walk through that distinction, perhaps? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, as you said, we propose that distinction between functional and formal. I don't know if the word are, are self-explaining, uh, but let's say very quickly that uh, functional variation for us is a variation uh, in the consequences of the behaviors. That is, if, if we speak very, very quickly, we, we could say the goal of the behavior, what is going to change in the environment. and uh, on on the opposite side, formal variation is what we call the topography. Do I pronounce it well? Topography, is it the right pronunciation uh, of the behavior. Let's say it's the way the behavior looks like. And uh, what we are really interested in um, when we are trying to work with clients, it's a functional variation because we can see people uh, move in every direction for the same goal, if, if I can say that. Uh, when, when someone's got a problem or, a, let's say, a face, uh, faces a difficult emotion or a difficult thought, he's going to try any behavior to fix that or to get rid of that emotion. And uh, from this is or her point of view, um, her behavior are going to be very different from, uh, let's say, drinking alcohol or going to, uh, I don't know, buy 100 pairs of shoes or things like that. Uh, on the topography, everything will look different, but the function will be exactly the same. And that function will be uh, one of them. It's very important for us will be to uh, avoid or uh, escape from uh, difficult emotions. So uh, what we propose in that, uh, in that uh, chapter is the fact that uh, psychopathology um, uh, mostly uh, is uh, a conjunction or a join, join result between uh, a very low functional variation and a very high uh, formal variation, at least for um, uh, psychological uh, issues uh, in people with um, uh, verbal skills, because we can have a very low uh, functional and very low formal variation in people, for example, suffering from uh, autism that uh, engage in a uh, uh, stereotypic behaviors, but this is, uh, of course, uh, a problem that let's say that it's not the, the, the problem we focus on in that chapter. We are really uh, focusing on, uh, as you uh, as you see at the end of the, of the chapter, on the um, consequences of language uh, for human, I mean, the, the consequences and the, the can language, sorry, the consequences language can have on uh, on psychopathology and, of course, for us on the way we can use it uh, in uh, in the psychotherapy. Yeah, in the uh, paper we tried to uh, touch on this issue of uh, human language, pointing to it as uh, kind of ironically. I mean, the the greatest sort of achievement of the human species, but also the source of human uh, uh, misery because it tends to so dominate other over other sources of behavioral regulation. And uh, so we, in the paper, walk through a, a situation in which we could have something which is, you know, quite adaptive in being able to problem solve and to uh, negotiate uh, the, the environment and changes in the environment. But precisely because it's all terrain and you can use it anywhere. And because it, it is so um, uh, 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 successful and is further supported by the group in all of the emphasis that we have on being right and being able to understand things and to have a coherent story, it tends to sort of take uh, charge over other sources of uh, behavioral variation, the other functional uh, behaviors which are important to us in terms of our psychological health. So for example, we may um, you know, be working more and more to achieve so that others will think well of us, driven, let's say, by a verbal formulation like that. 
while at the same time ignoring our immediate relationships and ending up in uh, shallow relationships and divorce and uh, loneliness and alienation, all inside uh, a verbal story that is about being um, approved of, liked, welcomed, etc., as part of the group, but missing uh, that as you chase that sort of verbally uh, ca cast goal, you're narrowing the functional variation more and more and taking le less time to uh, explore other aspects of uh, your repertoire other than figuring things out and problem solving in a, verbal, in a verbally driven, sort of symbolically dri driven way. And then we try to link that to psychotherapy. Psychotherapy tries to undo that. All psychotherapies do that in part by having creating an intimate, accepting, non-judgmental uh, relationship, which uh, can occasion uh, exploration of other kinds of uh, functional social behaviors that, that could be important and kind of reining in excessive rule following and uh, verbal regulation. Um, some forms of psychotherapy can target it specifically and uh, We've explored that in the act work, for example, of deliberately undermining excessive rule control and yeah, by teaching people mindfulness skills, being able to watch verbal formulations without necessarily either trying to push them away or comply with them. And so um, the analysis that we're presenting here with psychopathology links over to implications as to how we can uh, uh, better the human condition through direct intervention. Um, one of the, th I'm just if I say a final thing, kind of have gone through the paper, but this issue of sort of uh, structure and flexibility, we are arguing that functional flexibility is, is a healthy thing, but inside the psychological flexibility model are also the importance of being able to pick goals that are of importance to you and, and to pursue that. So there's actually a kind, there's another kind of skeletal structure there of uh, being able to deploy behavioral resources towards uh, valued ends, towards qualities of being and doing in the world that you want to uh, manifest. So we're not arguing for the value of chaos or uh, uh, just doing anything, but being able to get people out of uh, this uh, excessive narrowing of function around simply following the rules and uh, uh, avoiding things you don't like and ending up in a, a kind of a behavioral cul-de-sac as, as a result. Jean-Louis, have I summarized the later part of the paper okay? Do you want to add some things? Or? I think I think it's okay to summarize the paper, but maybe I can, if uh, David agrees, I can launch uh, the discussion right now by uh, taking uh, what uh, Rene uh, previously said, you said that um, for you, flexibility and inflexibility are two sides uh, of the same coin. I'm, I'm quite on, on, on the same uh, ground with, with you here, but I'm wondering if we are not facing um, two, two different moments. I mean, uh, can you expand on, on what you said, on the fact that inflexibility and flexibility can not go uh, all together? Yeah, so... I think part of the um, part of the thing that's really important here is to understand where different aspects of behavioral flexibility come from. So, learning as a mechanism, for example, is um, a very different kind of behavioral flexibility compared to the just sort of you know daily transition between behaviors that individuals go through in their daily life without thinking about it kind of the th that also is flexibility right you over the course of a day a behavioral uh, uh, an organism will go through an entire repertoire of different um um behaviors you know behaviors for um you know foraging and and getting mates and and all kinds of different things but those don't necessarily have to do with um learning as a mechanism underlying them and so I think um, I think that, and I'm not sure if um, if I'm saying this this um, very well, but I, I guess there's all these different kinds of mechanisms that underlie behavioral flexibility. And part of um, what I understood from your chapter is that is that one of the ways that psychopathology can manifest is when 
learning kind of um, the, the mechanism of learning leads to an endpoint where the organism is simply responding. So I, I think you guys used the example of drug drug addiction for for um, in a, a couple of times, and in that you have this uh, sort of you know neurological um, trap almost, right? Because the organism is getting this immediate positive feedback in the brain, pleasure from taking a drug. And that in um, evolutionary kind of sense was a signal to the organism, keep doing this. And so it, it sort of um, leads down this pathway to this uh, uh, sort of restriction of other types of behaviors. Um, and so I think that I guess, I guess for me, in order to understand the function of behavioral flexibility and when it's a good thing and when it's a bad thing is to sort of contextualize it under what category of flexibility it falls, whether it's coming from a, the learning um, mechanism or whether it's coming from like a daily rotation through your repertoire of behaviors, um, um, those sorts of things, I guess, or, you know, age-related changes. So that I, I feel like these are all very different kinds of yeah, let me uh, let me weigh in with a few uh, observations. Uh, my main observation after reading both chapters was how different they were. Both were tasked with the same general topic, uh, but they're very different. Both excellent, by the way, and both very evolutionary, and yet um, uh, uh, very very different. So uh, so uh, a lot of work is required, I think, to integrate them with um, with each other. Another observation is that. Um, I mean, it's kind of the nature of contextual behavioral science is that it's oriented towards um, the need to change. So uh, it could well be the case that 90% of individuals, uh, they function just fine, whatever their personalities and their learning mechanisms and so on, got them to a good place. Uh, we don't think much about them. We think about the people that are actually, uh, for any reason, uh, not functioning well. And so in, in that context, I think inflexibility is bad by definition and the need to change is, um, is good. So uh, that's just like the context in which uh, contextual behavioral scientists operate. Now a final observation and a kickoff for more, for more discussion is that I realized that um, uh, I think it's true that the um, contextual behavioral science, both in its treatment of Skinnerian processes and the special effects of language, more or less assume um, a universal human nature and don't say much about personality. Uh, and this is something that could be studied in non-human species. Once we realize that, that non-human non species have profound individual differences, uh, we could ask the question for them, uh, what does that mean in terms of their learning processes? Presumably all personalities are capable of learning, uh, but perhaps in different ways that we should be taking into account. Um, if we're going to um, if we're going to accomplish change, and to what extent do uh, uh, contextual scientists actually take this into account in their uh, when working with people? Maybe implicitly, there's an understanding that actually people are different in ways that are not likely to change, and that any particular person, when we try to help them change, there's some general principles that apply, but but we also have to accommodate the way you are and. And uh, and uh, and not to try to change that. So, anyhow, those are just some thoughts for uh, for uh, beginning this uh, task of uh, integrating the two chapters. And any one of you can kick in. Well, you know, the the issue of uh, personality has a, a long history in psychology. And one of the problems that you don't face if you're using uh, animal models is that we are very dominantly. Uh, left to uh, self-report the big five and so forth as the way to think about it, which has a lot of difficulties uh, uh, in it um, just because of the nature of human language itself. Some of these uh, differences are differences just in linguistic processes I and mean, going all the way back to Osgood's semantic differential and so forth. You can show that there's only so many dimensions that human language can reliably put through the filter of this uh, population-based, not individually based, uh, a thing called factor analysis, which is, uh, you know, really leaves the level of the individual 
over time and starts looking only at characterizing individuals in the context of the collective, which has huge impact. It was fought about when factor analysis was first put together. Should we look at rows and consistencies within people, within individuals across time or columns and consistencies in a population? And column thinking won. And, and that is hostile to a contextual behavioral science perspective, which is based on trying to understand processes within individuals across time and then collecting them. And so it's not that the nomothetic level is not important, but we need to be careful about our levels of analysis. Today, I mean, this takes us off into a methodological direction, but if it is just worth noticing because today with the arrival of experience sampling and with different analytic methods, we are now seeing not only uh, can you do the individual level of, of analysis, which of course behavior analysis has done uh, in its time series focus and so forth, but now really with the analytic methods to be able to look individual by individual across time with many, many, many samples of what's going on. Not only can you do that, but you reach completely different conclusions, completely different conclusions. And so the idea that we have five personalities to my, uh, in the five factor, my view, looking at it right now, I would say, I don't know that to be true. Right. Well, I was actually on my big question list. So let me actually expand upon that and pass it to Rene that I am also skeptical about um, the big five as basically an artifact of factor analysis, exactly as you said. Factor analysis will give you dimen orthogonal dimensions out of any data cloud. And now that we're getting a more mechanistic approach to individual differences, uh, thanks to the great work of people like Rene, and I, even I have done some of this work on non-human uh, non-human species, you know, what is the mechanistic research telling us about the so-called big five? And, and just to add to that, uh, the concept of a, of a norm, the, the term norm of reaction is uh, a, a term neither one of you used in your, in your chapters, but I think the way to think about this is that, uh, is that uh, all individuals have norms of reaction, so they're all responding to their environment in that sense. And what we mean by personality, different personalities, is different norms of reaction. And you actually have to get that kind of longitudinal data on individuals in order to create the norm of reaction for any particular individual. But at the end of the day, people can have really different norms of reaction. And so there's the temperamental personality differences. And Walter Mischel, as I understand it, is the person who championed that view for human personality uh, psychology. And uh, he was referenced by Renee, I think, in her uh, and her chapter. So, uh, Renee, uh, what do you have to say about all this? This is very, very important stuff. Yeah, this, um, both of your comments, I, I'm getting, I was getting really excited when listening to both of your comments because um, part of, part of the, um, my response is that because I am not in the field of psychology, I'm sort of blissfully ignorant of you know, um, many of the debates, I'm sort of getting up to speed now on many of the de debates in the, in the human personality literature. And for, for people who study animals, um, it's, it's sort of, it's interesting because it's both a blessing and a curse that we don't have insight into what the animals are actually thinking. We can't ask them. So the, the blessing of it is that we're not confused by whatever kinds of error might occur in sort of a self-reporting kind of context, because I'm not personally convinced that that is the best way to assess somebody's personality. Um, and, but, but we're, so, so we're not cursed with that sort of difficulty, but, it, but at the same time, that means that we can only get one dimension of information from animals. We can only just sit there and observe what they do, their actual behavior, their actual output. And what was, very interesting to me when I was started to read the human personality literature is that is the lack of is the lack of um, uh, studies that actually do that for humans that actually sit there and do a sort of um, uh, you know ethogram basically and and try to see if the personality um, sort of the personality criteria that they put toward humans actually correlates with any behavior because self-reporting and saying what you think about something is not behavior. That is, um, that is, that is not how, that is not the behavior that you show on a daily basis out in the real world. 
And to me, that's the, that uh, human personality psychologist, to me, it's, it's, would be a totally fascinating, um, and I'm not saying nobody's doing this because there, there, I, I read some really cool and fascinating studies um, during the course of this project that were talking, making this very point. So yeah, other people- Yeah, there's some, yeah. There's, there's, there's some but not nearly as much as there needs yeah, but, to but it, to me, that would be the best of both worlds to combine those things. Like you get insight into what the organism is thinking and their emotions and what they're feeling and all that sort of thing. And then you can actually map that onto various behaviors. So. Um, basically, to go back to the, the the points that you were making, I am not, but I'm I'm agnostic about what is the best way to measure personality, and I think that's the reason I have such a fascination with the sort of neuroendocrine basis of it, because I I strongly believe that there are consistent differences among individuals in the way they perceive and interact with the world, and I um and I don't know that like. It, it, and I think that the big five probably captures some of those dimensions because you do have this repeatability and it is correlated with some of the, the neuroendocrine kind of components that, um, that I outlined in my paper. But I think the reason I'm fascinated with trying to understand those trade-offs at a neurological level is because it can help us to actually really identify the true axes of trade-offs in, um, in the way that individuals perceive the world differently, I guess. So in that sense, I think that I'm, I'm not here to sort of be a big proponent of one particular personality scheme, I guess. Yeah, yeah. okay, all right. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, uh, curb myself from being the next one to speak. So uh, uh, Jean-Louis or uh, Steve, your, your turn, and then I'm gonna dive back in. Yeah, Jean-Louis, were you gonna say something? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> maybe I want to recall that, uh, our goals in uh, contextual behavior science are, we say, predict and influence. And the fact is that um, if, if we think that uh, predicting, predicting is important, it's because we think that there are, let's say, regularities in behavior. So I don't know if we could call that personality. I think we, we won't call that personality at all, but it means that um, we think that in... Uh, uh, almost uh, comparable uh, situation, people are going to behave the same way. Uh, but at the same time, I think that we can influence behavior means that we can change that. So we've got the, the both side uh, at the same moment. I, I don't know if I'm clear on that, but uh, if, I, if I go back to your um, question, uh, David, about personality, what um, disturbs me uh, about this concept is the fact that it seems to be structural. And actually, I kind of remember that in your chapter, um, Rene, uh, you are actually saying that the fact that it's um, uh, built during a, a window of time and after that, maybe it's difficult to change. And the fact that it's um, structural is not a problem for us because uh, we are not thinking of individuals as a tabula rasa. But the, the problem, I think, is that as soon as you, you define a structure, uh, you kind of uh, forget that the structure is going to be in interaction with um, changing environments. You see what I mean there? Yeah, yeah. I think that um, basically, one. Of, I think it, it's all about degree. So. I, I, I agree. The brain is this, you know, fascinating organ, organ that, you know, as I mentioned, is its function is to be flexible. Its function is to allow the organism to gather information and learn and, and to respond flexibly to the environment. Um, but, but that acknowledgement of that flexibility shouldn't prevent us from acknowledging that the period of development of brain development is going to have a profound impact on behavior for the rest of an organism's life. And, th and this, is, this is true for any, any bodily system. The, the period of development is when um, an organism is actually most open to incorporation of environmental variation, basically, in its, its form and, and function. And so um, it's not, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't want the I, I don't want what I wrote to come across as not as as being some sort of um, 
lack of acknowledgement about the extensive flexibility that there is in, in behavior in adults and in, in all organisms, but simply that, that, that it, it helps to acknowledge the limits of that in order to understand what kind of flexibility is possible. So th- I guess that, if that makes sense. Well, let me uh, actually bring in uh, some of the other chapters in this volume uh, and make, uh, give a concrete example with uh, uh, fast and slow life histories, um, harsh environments calling for fast life history strategies, benign environments calling for slow life history strategies, and then the empirical question about phenotypic plasticity, that uh, if uh, an individual experiences a harsh environment early in life, and begins to adopt a, a, a fast life history strategy early in development, how much of that becomes fixed? Um, we know this from attachment theory and not so easy to change basically because of what happened early in life. And we know that the mechanisms of phenotypic plasticity are sufficiently diverse that we could find examples of everything from prenatal effects that become fixed all the way to a chameleon-like ability to toggle back and forth between behaviors uh, in uh, adulthood, but uh, what's sometimes called phenotypic flexibility as opposed to uh, as opposed to plasticity. So I think, you know, these are all among the range of possibilities, and I think we all know this. We almost more or less have to know it, um, that uh, if somebody experienced uh, very hard times early in life or throughout their lives, it might not be as easy for them to uh, change out of that. Uh, and that might be a harder process, a harder therapeutic process than, um, than um, if that wasn't the case. So uh, what do you guys think? You know, just as your experience as uh, a therapist must take that kind of thing into account. You, you do need to take it into account, but we come back to this uh, uh, problem that we have of if you're focused on uh, prediction and influence, and then you look to the literature, uh, you know, immediately the, the constancies that are being talked about don't tell you very much about what you, how you need to adjust to them. And I think in part it's methodological and uh, it's not just self-report. Uh, uh, self-report actually, I, I wouldn't go so far actually as, as you did Renee on it. Uh, let me just, just say a couple things. Like if you just take the big five and then you say, well, what about learning strategies? Well, there's a whole literature on learning strategies linked to the big five. My summary of it, and I've not done a deep dive to it, but I have looked at it, is that there, the interactions are very weak. They don't tend to replicate from study to study. And uh, it doesn't tell you very much. So if you take something, it's mostly been looked at because of learning strategies linked to educational areas. You know, the big five will account for about between nine and 13 percent of how you do in school, let's say, just being able to succeed at school. The bigger studies uh, seem to center it down to probably the pretty the most most important one is openness to experience. Uh, Because being closed off to experience makes it you tend to rely on superficial learning strategies, not these deeper ones that uh, I think, frankly, are, are a little, require a little bit of uh, emotional openness, like you know, exploring different hypotheses, holding several different alternatives in mind at the same time, considering other points of view. These deeper learning strategies require a certain amount of tolerance of ambiguity. I'm not sure what the answer is, et cetera. They're, they're gonna predict better outcomes uh, over time. But now if I, Take that, let's just, just say that, and then I bring it into, into my uh, clinical work. Uh, it doesn't tell me very much about what to do because uh, frankly, openness to experience is what I'm targeting already. Um, and and uh, I would like a theory of uh, personality that was linked to what actually has happened to human beings over their lifetime. To me, self-report is fine. It's just another behavioral domain. Be careful not to say that self-report is the other things, but just to, to I'm, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm distracting the group by mentioning this, but the correlation between self-report and actual behavior is almost always said to be about 0.3. It's not true. When you look within individuals across time, it's around 0.6. But we're, our methodologies don't do that. <laughs> they, you know, all, even our psychometric evaluation of self-report instruments are all 
of the collective, whatever the heck that is. And this is not an interest in, you know, individuals and groups. I mean, this is the amorphous group then being taken to be the individual, which is just not right. And so we're in a, we're in a bit of a quandary. It doesn't tell us what to do. And so it doesn't seem, uh, so we, we, we kind of recognize So Now what we do look at what's in our chapter is essentially the emergence of these kind of behavioral patterns or rigidities that could be seen as personality types. So for example, if you become a heavy kind of I'm right person, if you kind of get into that cul-de-sac of, um, you know, that will easily take you into areas that will be called a personality. I think we're seeing that right now by watching the television screen and watching our president perform. Uh, you know, that's an obvious kind of personality you're looking at there. And it's one that's heavily dominated by I'm right. I'm the smart one. I'm the brilliant one. I mean, there's a few core kind of central attractors there that seem to predict a lot of that behavior. Well, that's exactly the kind of things that we're looking at clinically. And the, what we wrote about in our chapter is an example. It gives, gives you the tools. If we explore it out, we, it wasn't the primary focus for how we would get a more behaviorally sensible view of personality that could be applied sort of person by person by person. And so I, I, we're going to need more help from those, especially people like Renee, doing the deep dive into the human part of it. Uh, but I, a final thing, I'm a little skeptical about going too quickly to the, to the, the, the constancy of the brain until we put it through that, that uh, filter, because the brain, after all, is a, is a dependent variable as well as an independent one. I mean, it's a plastic organ. I was going to ask about that. When you do a study and you find, you know, uh, that you can trace behavioral differences to uh, brain anatomy differences, what is the cause and effect there? And to what extent does that, uh, does that reflect um, uh, the outcome of a developmental process? So, Renee, do you have a, 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 a beginning with Renee? Do you have anything yeah, to say I'll, about that? I'll, I'll be the first person to admit that this is just a, an idea right now. And, and um, the correlations that I talked about in my paper are to me, it's just the first building block of building a case that, that I even have a case, right? So you, like, if you didn't have those correlations at all, then there would be a pretty weak reason to even go look for these further structural like, causes of, of personality variation. So, um, oh yeah. So basically the other thing that, that we're, we're actually working on in my lab right now um, and with various projects is exploring the, um, exploring the sort of constraints, if, if, I, if I can use that word, it's also a loaded word, um, on flexibility of the brain. And the idea here is not that, it, it might be possible to achieve sort of any amount of flexibility that you want if you work hard enough at it. Like you might even be able to change somebody's personality type if that is the main goal. But it, to me, it seems like that would be a silly goal because it would require so much effort and so much work because, because what um, the, the sort of pre-existing structural trade-offs, if you will, do is they channel behavior in a certain way. And um, it's, that's not to say that it's sort of a permanent, like fixed thing that cannot be changed, but that the bar for change is higher um, in one direction than it is in, a, in another direction, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm, I'm being clear on this, but, but basically like, um, for example, you, you know, it's just, it's just simply a fact that there's limited space in the brain and there's all sorts of uh, uh, consequences of this. So, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, various um, experiments that, that they've done where, you know, if uh, uh, an animal can't see correctly during a certain developmental window, then when they, if they, uh, if their eyes, like say their eyes um, obscured by some sort of disease or something, and then it clears up later, if it was during that particular developmental window, it won't be wired properly. So they still won't be able to see out of the eye, even though it's completely functioning normally. And that's because there's limited space in the brain. And so um, as the brain develops, these trade-offs basically channel um, variation in particular ways. And, 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 and it's interesting because I, I really, really don't want to be taken as this sort of proponent that there's these really fixed components that cannot be changed. 
I simply want to understand what all the trade-offs are to understand what the, what the easy channels versus the difficult channels of change are, because I think that can help us to know where to put our efforts, where our efforts are most going to be uh, useful if, if the goal is behavioral change. Could I, but one of the problems there is you need to know the re reaction to context, and there could be very unusual contexts in which something that previously looked difficult is actually relatively easy. And let me give you an example. Uh, let's say you had a stroke and you now have uh, one limb that's, uh, one hand that's quite useful and one that isn't. Well, in, in the, the uh, journal Stroke, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, they looked at, well, what happened if you just tie down your functional limb? Just strap it to your body so you can't use it. Well, here you had an insult to the brain. You had a, a stroke. We know exactly why you're not able to use that right hand, let's say. Well, what happened is that within a period of about six months, the brain developed an entirely different uh, uh, set of neurological ways. And sure enough, you know, the previously inadequate limb now was quite adequate and the brain changed to support that. So well, the, the whole neuroplasticity is something we have a lot to learn about. So Yeah, exactly. exactly. And so you don't want to be kind of dismissive of that, but they, you look at things and not just in the, the neurobiology, but things like uh, Benson's study with uh, eight hours of uh, meditation uh, or eight sessions, eight weeks rather, of meditation changing around 7.5% um, of your genetic expression in a reliable way through methylation processes and epigenetic processes. Well, so, you, so you've got like, you know, cl close to 8% of your whole body, every cell being changed by this very, very small amount of odd behavior. I mean, it, it's a very odd thing to do what he has them doing, you know, essentially transcendental meditation demystified, you know, saying the word one over and over again, isn't something you'd probably just wake up in the morning and say, let me just do that. I'll just say the word one over and over again. You're not going to do that, but it has a massive, a massive impact on your underlying biology. And by the way, to the extent we understand these gene networks and often we don't, they're especially around issues having to do with response to stress. Well, you know, there is an example response to stress is like a huge part of what we know about behavior in the brain and, the, and how it works. And a very small but very unusual context has this massive impact. So I always want to, you know, look for constancy, but also just remember that context can change things that previously were thought to be unchangeable. And so we need both. Um, let me give an example of honeybees. Uh, I think I have this right, that uh, a honeybee worker is capable of doing all the tasks that honeybees do, honeybee workers do. So in that sense, you'd think that everything would be a matter of phenotypic plasticity. Nevertheless, um, it's important for the hive to be genetically diverse. They do much better than if a hive is genetically uniform, and it's not just a matter of disease. The, bee, the optimal situation is for an individual bee they actually have a predilection, a preference, a personality, if you like, uh, for a given task. So that as a default, then you will get a division of labor and different individuals doing different tasks. But if a particular task is in short supply or there's a special need for that task, then some bees shift over, basically. They do something that's not in their comfort zone. And so I think that's actually a really nice way to think about humans. Um, and part of what it means for humans to be members of highly cooperative groups is that maybe the best thing is for us to have our temperaments. You know, we all things considered, we'd really like to do it this way. You know, like I'm not a social person. I, I prefer to be solitary and so on. Uh, and yet I am capable of rising to the occasion. Uh, and uh, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if our evolutionary history actually called for that combination of drawing predilections, which are different from each other, um, and yet an ability to rise to occasions that are outside our uh, comfort zones. And it might be that, you know, that might be a nice way to think about human mentality. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I, I've got a. I think I've got a an analogy to propose uh, for personality because when I read your your chapter, really, I thought about. Stuff. I don't know if you know the the expression of the filter bubble on the internet. You know the fact that uh, uh, the algorithm are going to send you answers to your requests that uh, are always something that you like. Have you heard about that? You you are trapped in a sort of information bubble. I thought of. Um, what you wrote about personality, I, I just imagine that and what uh, came to me is the fact that even if you are trapped in, a, in that sort of, a, of bubble, you can burst it. I mean, if I take the analogy, you can go on the internet and Google, for example, and just ask Google, how can I burst the information bubble? So um, what came to my mind was the fact that if you take someone with a personality as, as you defined it, um, I mean, that that person is not locked. Uh, I mean, his or her behaviors are not totally defined, directly defined. Maybe the part of the environment is in contact with is defined, but maybe the question would be, can, can, can we uh, make a step aside? And for example, asking uh, help to someone else, a psychologist. And does, does this consist in, a, how can I say that? Um, Self-changing personality. Would, would you admit that self-changing personality can be possible? That changing personality is that what you're self-changing personality? I think you said. So I, so in the in the last part of my paper, so this is the part that I feel most insecure about um, because it's it's me sort of saying things about psychology, a field which I'm not, you know, it's not my. You're welcome. So that's my little caveat, but. Um, which is probably why I've been more tentative to discuss it so far. But basically, um, what I was trying to argue is that another way that psychopathology might manifest is if people become too extreme in their corner of whatever personality they are, they are in. And that is not necessarily a good thing. And that is something that we should strive to, to target, like that itself. Um, and, and I'm actually very interested in what, you know, what, um, John Louis and, and Stephen think about that because, um, like, like I said, I'm just dipping my toe into this field. But it strikes me that um, the extremes of any one of my one of my um, purposes in defining the different trade offs, the different neurological trade offs, is to actually figure out what those extremes would be. Because until you know that, you can't target trying to center people more in a, a more, a less extreme way. And so I guess from my perspective, I definitely think that it's not this rigid fixed aspect of a person, but is something that can be modulated and moderated and perhaps could be an important goal of psychotherapy. That's, um, it, that's, um, and yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, now our hour is up. So I think what we could do, we could spend another hour easily, but maybe uh, let's have that, Renee, your final statement. Uh, perhaps you'd like to add to it and then have a final statement uh, in response to that by uh, Jean-Louis and, uh, and, uh, and, and Stephen. And then that'll wrap up our uh, very excellent conversation. Steve, go ahead. Oh, why don't you respond, Renee, and then, because uh, you asked that question. Renee, uh, uh, did you mean John Louis? Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I did. It was a brain cramp. I, well, I, I asked Renee, do you have anything to add to that? If this is going to be your final statement, I'm sorry, Renee. Um, yeah, I guess I guess I just I just from my perspective, just kind of as a sort of final kind of wrapping up statement, I think it's interesting to explore the idea that having a more individualized <clears throat> understanding of of a person's personality, um, how that might feed back into the strategy for helping them in, in a psychotherapy kind of context and how that might feed back into the types of uh, 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 different, you know, ways that you, you, would, you would maybe try to help them uh, come back, either come to a more centered place or increase their behavioral um, flexibility. So yeah. I'll end with that. Great. Jean-Louis, I'm sorry I misdirected, uh, but uh, uh, I'll let you uh, pick up from there and then uh, 
So uh, maybe because I, I felt that um, um, tried open to explain us that uh, she is not on a fixed position, and I really understand that. But maybe to be fair, um, maybe Steve, you you agree on that. We, we as a clinical psychologists, we we want to believe that uh, behavior can change. So we maybe our our uh, our view of that problem is a bit. Um, um, placed on the on the fact that yeah. we can do everything. You know what I mean? That we are magicians. I mean, we all, we often face a uh, problem with clients that is, that are very difficult to help to change. But the uh, fact is that we we often see that uh, change is possible. So maybe that's why we are biased uh, in that direction. But I think that everything we we said today. Uh, uh, built a common ground that I hope we, we could um, expand uh, further later. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, this issue of uh, personality, I, I think there's a little route into uh, something that sh should be said just by the etymology of the word. I mean, pers persona was in Latin meant mask or false face. And it was the clay masks that they wore in uh, in Roman uh, theater, and uh, this idea that you know when you feed the extremes, that's actually unhealthy, and you want to broaden it. I think can be put very much in the way that David was just talking about in terms of multi-level selection and and how groups work and and work well. That too much of any one thing in a group, but it's also within the individual tends to be uh, unhealthy. And when you do hit an adaptive peak, when you've you know pursued something which is uh, you know positive in the short run, but has, has led you to the point where further uh, development in terms of variation selection retention processes can no longer work, you need to have access to a, a broader uh, a repertoire. And so one way to think about this is just uh, as we get to the extremes, what we're dealing with is a kind of uh, selfishness uh, within, that there's many parts of us. Um, you know, you mentored, mentioned Walter Michel, but what are, Walter Michel is mostly known for in psychology is showing that some of these personality traits are context specific. And you will look a particular way in a particular context repeatedly, but in another context, you might look quite different. And some of what I think we're trying to do in psychotherapy is to arrange very unusual contexts in which your repertoire can expand and help people show, see how they could then use the previously undeveloped aspects of, of, of their own uh, behavior and psychology, how they could deploy them usefully in areas where that would be helpful. And so that same kind of insight that's there uh, let's say with uh, the bees or uh, the kind of things that people will see elsewhere in, in this volume when we look at the small groups and, and how they uh, function well and applying some of these principles, multi-level selection to them, I think can apply within. And that uh, some of what we call personality is a false face that we present even to ourselves when we've allowed certain aspects of our repertoire to so dominate that we've not attended to the other things. That's what's in our chapter. The very, very common uh, example of that being that these verbal regulatory processes, uh, logical, analytical, self-critical, -crit predictive processes dominating over other aspects of simply observing, appreciating, connecting, uh, uh, valuing, caring about those kinds of softer processes that. Uh, sometimes get stomped on by us trying to uh, be right and to be successful problem solvers, uh, even if that means turning our life into a problem to be solved instead of a process to be appreciated. So um, I, I'm kind of with you, Renee, on that last part of your uh, chapter, and we're kind of the folks who are trying to, uh, in the clinic, and uh, find ways to actually produce that broadening of the repertoire to help people behave uh, more effectively given uh, what it is they're trying to accomplish in their lives. Yeah, so um, um, here's my final uh, thought, and it goes back to this idea that movement requires a skeleton, that there's something 
about flexibility that requires inflexibility. And I think that statement is so general that not only does it apply to the sort of phenotypic plasticity the way uh, Rene has, uh, uh, has uh, uh, developed it, but it also applies to things that are even purely socially constructed. And I know as someone who studies religions, as, a, as, as, a, as cultural uh, constructions, is that they have a skeleton. They have, it's even called a morphology and an anatomy. You know, certain axiomatic pre uh, premises of a, of a religion, they don't change, and yet they enable change along some, uh, some dimension. So to think that movement requires a skeleton uh, as something that's true for any functioning entity I think is probably a good way to think about it because it, 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 it uh, then relegates other questions, which are still very large questions, such as innateness, effects of early experience, the degree to which uh, individual differences, um, there are important individual differences in learning abilities, you know, different styles and all that, um, to empirical questions, basically, that, uh, that can be settled empirically. Well, everyone, uh, how great is this for it to be captured for eternity in our webinar? So thanks, and, uh, and uh, this was great. I look forward to the next one.